لكن تحديت الظروف وخذتها وحدي صبورا مستعينا بالصلاة كم مرة عصف الأنين بداخلي كم مرة قد ذاك قلبي من أسى محرمتها وكم كرهت مصابها now, the main part of the video now is referring to the fatwa now. So you see the early Dawah al as principles, okay? And we're not just taking any abstract evidences we're showing you. I could show you a lot more as well uh, in future videos. But one can say that the fatwa that Bin Baz rahmatullah gave was incorrect. And Shaykh al-Albani rahmatullah as you can see on screen, he also disagreed with it. Many of the ulama disagreed with it. So it's not, you know, haji, uh, you know, a nobody in Birmingham. And I say, I'm, I'm, I'm a nobody, you know, I'm just a simple brother from Birmingham. You know, who are you to disagree with the Sheikh? Well, he's not infallible, I can. Like Muhammad Abdul Wahab, he's not infallible, I can. And this is what it is, they've monopolized uh, that Tawheed is, you know, rooted in the early Da'wat al So if you oppose the early Da'wat al Najdiyah, by extension, you oppose Tawheed or you've, uh, you're against Tawheed. This is rubbish and this is absolutely nonsense. So, you know, you're not going to bully us no longer, I assure you. I assure you. All right. So. Backdrop regarding the Gulf War, okay, and it could be more expansive, uh, but in a nutshell, okay, let me have some water, Bismillah. In a nutshell, okay, Saddam Hussein, and he was a tyrant, no doubt about it, uh, and I could say, may Allah have mercy upon him, no doubt about it, you know, I believe he died a Muslim from what was apparent, may Allah have mercy upon him, but he was a tyrant, no doubt about it, throughout his life, he was a tyrant. Absolute tyrant, and he committed many uh, atrocities that one cannot excuse. So, just to get that out there as well. But his ending, you know, may Allah have mercy upon him and forgive him for his uh, atrocities. The Gulf War started when Iraq, or before it started, shall I say, uh, invaded into Kuwait. And this was aggression, and this was more domestic between Iraq and Kuwait. So, he inv invaded into Kuwait and he settled his troops there so what happened was um, Saudi Arabia started panicking and they believed they were next or they believed that Saddam Hussein was going to attack and enter into their territory now I say this clearly these tyrant rulers will slaughter the whole world and whoever's in it to preserve their throne let's just put it out there and they'll give re religious legitimacy for that 500,000 american personnel to enter into jazirat al-arab the arabian peninsula desecrating uh, the jazirat al-arab now before i start okay before i start what i want to show you is how precious muslim life is and what are the objectives of the Sharia? What are the muqasid of the Sharia? Now, as an alim, when you're faced with a predicament, you have to have an overview of the muqasid of the Sharia. Now, remember, Saddam Hussein, they made takfir of, but are you saying by extension that the population of kuffar? Because now that you made takfir of him, then obviously by extension you made takfir of his army. So, if you made takfir of Saddam before, be, be, for being a ba uh, from among the Bahthiyya, and there were other uh, uh, leaders are, uh, from the Bahthiyya as well. Uh, conveniently, they weren't made takfir of, and we'll get to that, you know, uh, shortly. As you can see on screen, we've got the book Al Muwafaqat by Imam Shatabi. Okay, Imam Shatabi, rahmatullah alayhi. And he mentions, al ummatu, bal sa'irul milal. So he mentions that that the agreement from the Ummah that the Sharia was placed to preserve five uh, objectives, meaning necessities. First one, Wahiyad Deen. First, the religion needs to be preserved. The necessity, okay, of the preservation of religion. Okay. One nafsu, life. Okay, life needs to be preserved. It's Dururiyat. Okay, is from the amongst the Dururiyat. Number three, Wal Naslu, lineage. Number four, Wal Malu, wealth. And number five, Wal Aklu, Wa Ilmuha, Indal Ummati, Kad So there you go. So you've got there 
uh, the ob objectives of the Sharia, the necessity of the objectives of the Sharia, which is the preservation of r religion, life, okay, uh, lineage, uh, wealth, and intellect. Okay, so bearing in mind that there's a fitna that's brewing, okay, in Kuwait, we've got Madawi al Rashid, okay, in her book, A History of Saudi Arabia, when she explains it, she goes all the way from the start and she, she, all the way to like <laughs> for the late 90s. She mentions, subhanAllah al Adib, she mentions, here you go, I'll read it first and I'll present it to you. It says, The Gulf War and its aftermath, 1990 to 2000. So she's obviously discussing that. Two major challenges faced the Saudi government in the 1990s. Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait on the 2nd of August 1990 proved to be problematic not only for the Kuwaitis but also for their for their Saudi neighbors okay the war was an unprecedented event in that for the first time Saudi Arabia felt that it was under imminent threat of invasion by a neighboring Arab state okay so that's what uh, Saudi Arabia believes so obviously Kuwait is in the Gulf isn't it so it's ne next to Saudi Arabia now look what Madawi Rashid a senior lecturer in the social anthropology at King's College, University of London. Okay, so she's obviously well versed in this. And she says, although an annexation of Saudi Arabia by the Iraqis was highly unlikely. Okay, weren't going to happen. It was highly unlikely. The Saudi government and the United States could not rule out the possibility of military action near the important oil fields of the Eastern province. Okay, so America. Okay, America. Okay, I'm going to get to their history as well to show you, was it really a wise move to call them with their history prior to this? The liberation of Kuwait became a priority for the Saudis, not only to restore the exiled Kuwaiti ruling family to government, but also push, also to push the Iraqi army beyond its imminent, imminent borders, immediate borders. Sorry. Saudi Arabia became the territory from which the liberation of Kuwait was to take place. The li this liberation was dependent on the assistance of American troops under the umbrella of a multinational force. So remember, the Saudis, when they announced or gave the fatwa uh, to um, legitimize, uh, to desanctify, to desecrate the Arabian Peninsula, uh, they were under the banner of the multinational force. Okay, so they weren't in control. Okay, so they gave complete authority. Okay, to the NATO force. This important development brought about King Fahd's second problem: the strengthening of Islamist opposition immediately after the Gulf War. And then this is where Sheikh Rabi and their likes came in. So this is where the the Salafi Dawah, that was the Salafi, took a drastic change after this. And we're going to go into it in another video. And there was another problem as well that they faced, which resulted in this diluted version we see today. The causes of the Islamist opposition predated the Gulf War, but the war itself was a catalyst that the opposition used to voice their general dis discontent with their government over important issues. So it was brewing before that. Okay, uh, TV stations and you know, there were other things as well that resulted in like, you know, the, um, the Islamists as they like to call them, you know, having an issue with the uh, Saudi government. But let's bring it forward because then you can read it because I can't put the uh, it on screen. So there you go. There it is there. So there's the Gulf War here. You go up. So I just place it there. Just read that a bit. Okay, and then move up. There you go. So up to there. There's more, there's more, but, you know. Uh, so you go, Madawi Rashid. Okay, so, it weren't, it was highly unlikely that the Iraqis would have actually invaded into Saudi Arabia. It was highly unlikely. And it was basically um, Uncle Sam whispering into the Saudis ears. And, you know, the, the creation of the Third Saudi State, obviously, with the, their involvement with uh, <laughs> Western powers, because they basically created them. Um, was nothing new. Before I get into the catastrophic implications of this fatwa, who did they seek assistance from? They sought assistance from America. Do you know the history of America, of their brutal campaigns in other countries prior to Iraq? Okay, so let's give you one example, okay, which is very well known. On August 6th, 1945, during World War II, 1939 to 1945, an American B-29 bomber dropped the world's first deployed atomic bomb over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Hiroshima, I think it's called. The explosion immediately killed an estimated 80,000 people. Tens of thousands more would later die of radiation exposure. Three days later, a second B-29 dropped another A-bomb on Nagasaki, killed an estimated 40,000 people. Japan's emperor, 
Hirohito announced the country's unconditional surrender in World War II in a radio address in August 15, citing the devastation power of a new and most cruel bomb. Okay, and also as you can see on screen, the New York Times mentioned uh, Vietnam, so they also obviously, uh, what, how many, 45, what is 1945 was it? So 10, uh, 20, uh, 22 years after, um, they invaded into Vietnam. Many massacres happened there, and the massacre of the uh, Mai Lai massacre in 1967. And there's, there's full details. You've got to sign up and pay for that, but already in other websites. But I don't want to focus on that too much. So, as the Maqasid al-Sharia, uh, the five Dururiyat, okay, the preservation of life, etc. So, when the ulama, the senior, the, the, the Hayat Kibar al ulama that were discussing this, uh, the Maqasid al-Sharia should have been taken into account. And we're going to get into the devastation caused by the Gulf War as well. And America's history in, you know, dropping you know atomic bombs and you know invasions in, in in vietnam and also panama and also in other areas prior to this um let's be honest it was an irresponsible fatwa to allow uh you know the americans into jazeera al arab first and foremost you know we got prophetic narration that says expel them uh, and we'll show you about bin baz as well uh, may allah forgive him um his fatwas uh prior to this was upon that Understanding. So what happened? What changed? Okay, so let's look now. As you can see on screen, we've got Charles Kurzman, okay, uh, who wrote pro-US fatwas, okay. Now, Dr. Kurzman teaches sociology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's an editor of anthologies, Liberal Islam and Modernist Islam, 1840-1940, and author of The Unthinkable Revolution in Iran, 1977-1979, to Harvard University. So he wrote a... Um, a piece, an academic piece, talking about this particular um, issue. Now it mentions regarding Bin Baz, okay, Rahmatullah alayhi. When Iraqi troops overran Kuwait on August the second, nineteen ninety, Saudi Arabia may have been the next target. May have been the next target. Regardless of Saddam Hussein's action intentions, the Saudi monarchy felt threatened enough to invite U.S. forces to serve as a deterrent. Okay, so they invited them. At the same time, the Saudi monarchy appears to have be, to to have worried that the presence of non-Muslim soldiers could in, in unsympathetic eyes be viewed as incompatible with the regime's self-proclaimed responsibility to protect the two holy mosques, the foundational sites of Islam in Mecca and Medina. King Fahad and other Saudi leaders convinced Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, convinced chairman of the Supreme Council of Ulama to issue a fatwa in support of the regime's decision. So they already made the decision, they just needed a fatwa for it. So he was used, let's be frank. May Allah forgive him, may Allah forgive him. Huge mistake, and Sheikh Albani also was against this. Bin Baz and his colleagues did so, given the need to defend the nation. By all possible means, the Supreme Council of Ulama supports what was undertaken by the ruler. May God grant him success. The bringing of forces equipped with instruments capable of frightening and terrorizing those who wanted to commit an aggression against his country. This duty is dictated by necessity in current circumstances. Okay, so Dorura. Okay, and made inevitable by the painful reality and its legal basis and evidence dictates that the man in charge of the affairs of the Muslims should seek the assistance of the one who has the ability to attain the intended aim. The Quran and the Prophet Sunnah, or the Prophet Sunnah activities and statements have indicated the need to be ready and take precautions before it's not before it's too late. So that's the justification he gave. So Charles Kurzman also mentioned the Saudis also solicited support from the Muslim World League, which gathered 350 Islamic scholars in Jeddah in early September 1999. After bus tours of Mecca and Medina showing visitors that non-Muslim troops were not stationed in these highlands sites, the league issued a statement that backed the Saudi decision as a temporary emergency measure. Now listen to this. When Operation Desert Shield was transformed into Operation Desert Storm, switching the defense of Saudi Arabia to the reinstatement of the Asaba monarchy in Kuwait, Bibad again issued a supportive fatwa. So now another fatwa came because it changed from Desert Shield to Desert Storm. The, the jihad that is taking place today against the enemy of God, Saddam. So he's an enemy of Allah, Azza wa Jal. The rule of Iraq is a legitimate jihad on part of Muslims and those assisting them. Those assisting them. It's a legitimate jihad for them as well. Okay. Bin Baz stated, for he has wrongly transgressed and committed ang aggression against and invaded a peaceful country. Therefore, it is obligatory to wage jihad against him, to expel him unconditionally from Kuwait, to assist the oppressed to restore justice and to deter the oppressor. Bin Baz was later promoted to chief mufti of the monarchy, no doubt in part for his supporting the monarchy's alliance with the United States. Okay. Now what I want to do is show you Sheikh Bin Baz's stance before this, according to Charles Kruzman. And he said, Bin Baz's support for alliance with non-Muslims was a departure, listen to this, 
from his usual position that Muslims should avoid working or socializing with non-Muslims. In a series of statements on proper personal conduct, now this is not just basically mu'amalat. He mentions Bibaz quoted the Quranic Surah, Surah 3, Al Imran, verse 118, described in the English version of Bibaz collected fatwas. O oh, you believe, take not as your bitana, advisors, consul consultants, protectors, helpers, friends, those outside your religion, pagans, Jews, Christians, and hypocrites, since they would not fail to do their best to corrupt. A more common approach considered this a similar verse is to refer to only to enemies in times of war. So this is to our enemies in times of war. Even more to the point, in response to a question about a non Muslim guest worker in Arabia, Bimbaz argued that their presence posed a great danger. So look at this now. May Allah forgive him. A great danger both to Muslim control of the central lands of Islam and to the personal faith of individual Muslims who might grow to become close to them and rely upon them, or even claim due to the whisperings of Satan to him, meaning the Muslim, that they are brothers in humanity. This is not correct, for brotherhood in faith is the true brotherhood, and as long as there is a difference in religion, there can be no brotherhood. Bimbaz quoted a statement of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, which we mentioned, Verily I will expel the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula, until I leave none but... Now, it's clear from that, that Sheikh Bimbaz contradicted his whole stance. Personal mu'amalat, you know, dealing with, like, maids or workers that come down are muslims uh, that many uh, maids do come which are treated unjustly as well and that's obviously another topic um he was against it he was against just like workers coming like it, it corrupt you know and he used the hadith that the prophet says said, said that expelled the jews and the christians from the arabian peninsula and that was just for the mu'amalat like you know like abu lu'lu al-mujusi was allowed in Medina because of his need, because of or because of the need of his of his skills. So there was an exception made for that. So if you know non-Muslim maids, you know the Saudi families want maids to look after their children or workers or migrant workers, you know that could be a necessity. The way uh, Umar bin Khattab anhu allowed Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi to you know work in Medina, like uh, he was a slave of Mughayr bin Shu'ba. Now look how he changed. May Allah forgive him that he, the fatwa allowing 500,000 American personnel which continue to stay, we continue to have a presence in the Arabian Peninsula. Now, the, the kingdom could have issued a fatwa to allow Muslim armies from all over the world, you could have paid them, you know, to support the uh, defense against Saddam Hussein. Okay, that was, they could have done that. And they could have reinstated the Kuwaiti uh, monarchy themselves, you know, and look at who are they seeking aid from? Like those who have been involved in mass war crimes, like, you know, America's been, you know, and the, in Panama, Cuba, El Salvador, uh, you name it, where they haven't been, you know, Vietnam, Japan, like Philippines, like SubhanAllah Adim, and they're known for the brutality. And you can see it now, you know, Afghanistan, 2001, 2003, Iraq, on a, on a pretext of a, of a lie, you know, and it was irresponsible. It was a fatwa that had damaging effects, which we are result, which we can w witness to this day, that it was an irresponsible fatwa. And, you know, the rulers already made the decision and, and the fatwa was given. Now, may Allah forgive him, and as I said, it's not an attack on the Shaykh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, elevate his ranks, uh, you know, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, grant him uh, Jannatul Firdaus. I've got nothing against the Shaykh, so don't please, you know, perceive this to be like a hajj is going on and an all out attack against the Sheikh. No, you know, I, I admire him, I respect him. And this was a mistake, a, a, a very major mistake. And the consequences of this mistake we are witnessing today. So I just want to, you know, get that out there. We hear the neo Salafi say when we talk about Khuruj, we say, they say it causes more harms. It causes more harms. Now, what was the harms caused by this fatwa now? Okay. What was this harm caused, caused by this fatwa? I agree, you shouldn't do khuruj. It's best not to do it. You should avoid it at all costs. But at certain times, depending on the level of oppression, the degree of oppression, whether it's macro oppression or micro, you know, you have to assess your situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to defend ourselves. People don't know about this. So Human Rights Watch uh, did a report in 1991. And the violations caused needless deaths in the Gulf War, as you can see on screen. Uh, there's about four parts to it, but I'm just going to get to the main part. So let's go to the background and the main point. Now, the view from the ground, eyewitness accounts of civilian casualties and damage. This chapter contains testimony about civi civilian casualties and damage taken by Middle East Watch from former residents of Iraq who fled during the war. The accounts are organized geographically beginning with Baghdad and Basra, Iraq's largest cities. Journalists reports and information from post-war visitors to Iraq are cited when they corroborate accounts of eyewitnesses interviewed 
witnesses interviewed by Middle East Watch or provides supplement supplemental information. Most of the testimony included here was collected in February 1991 by Middle East Watch in random interviews with evacuees and others in Jordan. Additional accounts were obtained from the war from interviews Middle East Watch conducted in New York, London, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. We must emphasize that this testimony provides only a partial view, not a comprehensive accounting of civilian, civilian casualties and damage in Iraq during the air war. Moreover, as it is true throughout the report, the accounts in this chapter represent only some of the testimonies obtained by Middle East Watch. Accounts were omitted if details were sketchy or information was contradictory. Then he mentions, the Iraqi authorities told United Nations representatives who visited the country in March 1991 that about 9,000 homes housing some 72,000 people have been destroyed or badly damaged during the air war. Some 2,500 of the buildings were in Baghdad and another one, and 1,900 in Basra. However, one member of a US delegation who visited Baghdad for four days after the war did not find physical evidence in the city to support the Iraqi government figures. After traveling around Baghdad, she concluded that the Iraqi figures were not credible. The air war, there were press reports that some of the allied attacks on bridges in Baghdad were flawed. In the bombing of the city for a 12 hour period, look at that, on the night of, the, of February the 6th to the 7th. So imagine being bombed for a 12 hour period, subhanAllah. For example, the Associated Press reports that a missile hit houses in the uh, Adhamiya neighborhood northwest of the city center during a midnight raid, killing six. The missile may have been intended for nearby Ahmadiyya Bridge over the Tigris River, some 200 yards away. 107. One of the houses burnt to the ground in the attack was owned by a Kurdish family. They left Baghdad before the war began and I came back yesterday convinced nothing would happen. A man whose sister lived in one of those houses told AP two hours later five of them were dead. They were burnt alive. All the people who lived in the area around the bridge have collected their belongings and left for the countryside. And it mentions obviously that restaurants were destroyed, civilians, civilians were killed near Sarafiya Bridge. Several two-story buildings with stores on the first front residents were above, uh, above were damaged or destroyed on the first night of the war in Waziriya neighborhood just north of the city center. According to a Mauritanian student interviewed by Middle East Watch, he went to the neighborhood the morning after where he saw smoke rising fearful for his schoolmates who lived there. For human rights representative visited an old residential section in the city of Az-Zubair. He saw severely completely destroyed homes around large bomb crater. Residents reported that the attack occurred at 10.30 p.m. On, the, on January the 18th. 17 were killed and another 15 injured in 10 houses. They said the doctors or the doctors in the town told PHR that approximately 200 civilians were killed and 3 to 400 injured during the war. And it carries on. Hospitals were destroyed, etc. Now, again, you could go, I'll put the link in the, uh, in the bio. You could read the report. It's a very lengthy report and it shows the needless deaths that were caused during the Gulf War. غريب في الحياة وفي الممات ومجهول الهوية والصفات كذا كانت حياتي دون معنى يفسرها ككل الكائنات غريب في الحياة وفي الممات ومن جهول الهوية والصفات كذا كانت حياتي دون معنى يفسرها ككل الكائنات